two parking tickets in three days. That's how I started last week. Now I park in the same place every day, at the same time, every day. But I was late for work, I was flustered, it's raining, I've been trying not to use my phone so it's in my pocket and it's raining, so I forget. And then I have that wonderful experience where at the end of the day you come back to the car and there's that little white thing flapping on the windshield. It's surprisingly easy to get a parking ticket. Paying for one, not as easy. So I go to the Easy Park website to pay for my parking violation. Add to basket. This is not shopping. I'm not having fun. Okay, I'll do that. Now what? Add to basket again. I already did that. Where's the basket? Uh, already in basket. Appeal. I'd like to appeal to your sense of reason and end this madness. Where's the... Okay, up here. All right, I'll click on that. View cart. I thought I was in a basket. Now I'm in a cart. Presumably, because it, it's bigger and I can put more shit in it. Like, what else can I get? Oh, two for one flat tires. Maybe a discount on a broken window. I'd like a discount on my parking ticket. What can I do? All right. Uh, okay, I can remove it. I can cancel it. I can add a violation. This entire process is a violation of my human rights. Let's keep going down and check out. Okay, returning customers, log in or sign up. Why would I sign up if I'm a returning customer? Uh, guest checkout, I'll try that. You do not need to create an account, but we want your email address. Not doing that. I'll try this. Okay, get through. Now what? Note. You must use a space in the postal code. Where do I put the postal code? There's no form. So again, I click the Pay Now button, and they take me to a different website. This is not Easy Park. It's not even branded. There was no logo. It's just a giant form where I have to put in sensitive information. In case I've forgotten, must use a space in the postal code. So now I'm really, really, you know, I'm going to pay attention to this. So I very carefully go down here, and I put in the postal code with a space. So I'm succeeding. I click Next. Payment confirmation. Oh, I haven't paid yet. Why are you confirming this? Please put a space in the postal code. <laughs> it's right fucking there. <laughs> I did it already. <laughs> click Next to proceed. There's no Next button. <laughs> pay Now. There's no Pay Now button. Purchased items. I didn't buy anything. I spent $48 twice on nothing. <sighs> now that is not content marketing, but it is content. It's part of the experience. Every little thing we create, we write is content, and it's part of how we present ourselves. That was not good. That was a generic e-commerce flow. It had nothing to do with paying for a parking ticket. So what was wrong? It wasn't designed with purpose. It wasn't designed for the purpose of paying a parking fine. It was just generic. No meaningful data. Throughout this whole transaction, they didn't learn anything about me that they could subsequently use to provide a better experience, and they didn't show the product. Now, in their case, the product is their app, because when you have the app, you're more likely to use them. You know, you, when you're going to park, you'll often see two parking lots. If I see them and I have the app, I'll go there, because I don't want to use the broken credit card machine and I have no coins. Right? So it's a good thing if I have the app. Get the slides and everything of that landing page. I will share that again at the end. So why am I saying this? Well, in part, it's because of experiences like that, but in part, it's, uh, it's different now. When we started Unbounce, 2009, Content was very powerful. Uh, now everybody does it, we all know that, so it's more and more difficult to stand out. And just the, the approach we take, like, uh, need a new blog post, let's write an ebook, new webinar, let's have make a course. That's not good enough. That's not a good reason for doing it. I wrote this on a whiteboard in December because I was angry. 
We've always done landing pages, but at the end of last year, we released two new products, pop-ups and sticky bars. This represents adoption. The one, this is our landing page customers, only 6% of them had adopted the new products. That's terrible. I was really angry. And I was hanging out with my co-founders, and Carter, our president, says, all right, fine, just stop complaining. What are you going to do about it? So a blog post released every day in January, written by me. So I committed to writing 30 blog posts about product awareness, like technical, demo focused, like really showcasing the product. And the reason I said I'll do 30, like one every day, is because if I'd said I'll do three, I would have done none. Right? It was that challenge and the fact that I told everybody I'd look like an idiot if I didn't do it. So I began this process. Now, a little bit of context about our blog. Historically, 0.3% is the conversion rate to NTS. NTS is a new trial start. So I'm putting the credit card down to start a trial. This again is pretty terrible, but <laughs> I haven't written on the blog for two years. So uh, I, I didn't even look at this lemma before I started. I looked at it afterwards. If I'd seen that, I may have changed my mind entirely. But anyway, so that's the context. That's how it performs. Uh, I was pretty, you know, shocked by that. This was what was in my head. Apparently, a lot of other people have the same question. And a lot of content marketers use that question to create content about this. Uh, so in order to figure it out, I reached out to other people, other founders. And Andy Crestedina is my favorite content marketer. I respect him immensely. So I asked him, from Orbit Media, 90% plus of their traffic comes from their blog, only 0.03%. Uh, converts. That's, that's even worse. Uh, but he's OK with that, because as he explains it, and you'll know as SEOs, this is what drives the links, the content, and builds domain authority. So when someone searches for Chicago web design development, they find them. Right? It's that supporting role. And you have to know how it converts, but also be OK with it, because it is for a different purpose. But I wasn't OK with it. I wanted to improve it, because I needed more product adoption. So. Someone asked me, well, how do you come up with all the ideas for all these posts? The way I did it, I started with a concept that I call productizing our technology. Because we have more products. You'll have more products than you think. What I did, I took across the top. This is our core tech, landing pages, pop up sticky bars. These are the features. These are hacks and workarounds that people in our community have come up with, uh, our CS team has written, or other people in the company. How can we use those and some integrations? came up with all of these mini product ideas. Because when you combine things like that, you can just brand it as a new product, because if it has a functional use. Here's an example. When you come to an e-commerce store, you, it's very common you'll get a pop-up immediately. It's like it's too aggressive, but it's usually for a discount. And you usually want that. So I wanted to change how that, in, that works, because typically, like I want it, but go away. So I, wanted to, I changed it to this concept called maybe later. So you have yes or no, but then in the middle, there's a third option. If I choose that, because I'm interested, but please leave me alone right now, it will turn to a sticky bar that follows you on the site. It's there when you need it. So this is a functional use case for e-commerce. I could brand that, put some content around that to bring people to that, because it's a different way of thinking. Your customers can't imagine every way they can use your product. Sometimes you have to create content to guide them. So I wrote a post about it with instructions how to do it. It's very useful. It helps people do a better job, and it shows the product. Right? You, it, you can't just dump your product everywhere and think people are going to buy it. You have to make it exceptional and useful. So I wrote, in the end, only 20 posts, 37,000 words, because I got the flu at the beginning, and I'm writing on weekends, 15 hours a day. No one reads blogs on the weekends. So I spaced it out a little bit, because uh, honestly, my wife, Nicole, probably would have left me if I had <laughs> been ignoring her that much for the entire month. Incidentally, that's half of the length of an average New York Times bestseller. So I'll just do it again sometime and publish a shitty book. Uh, <laughs> so at the end of it, it doubled the conversion rate, right? doubled the blog average. So I'm like, yes, OK, this had an impact. right? This is not. And this is something we should be doing, but that doesn't scale at all. I can't keep doing that. So I wanted to know a way, how can I systematize this or just make it more scalable 
you know, so it is customer-centric content. That's very important, but it has that product lens, uh, and so it scales. As with anything tough in your life, sometimes you just need a little bit of help from your mother. So this is my superhero mom. Uh, <laughs> so I did all these sketches, and Nicole's like, could you make her a little less sexy? I'm like, I'm not that talented when it comes to this. I tried, and she looked like a witch. So that's how it's staying. I do not want to see any Yo Mama jokes on Twitter, because if you like what I'm talking about, it'll be your mother at some point, so keep it clean. Now, because she's wise, she has some rules to live by. Start with purpose. This is about figuring out the aha moments of your product and using those as your goal when you start creating your content. I don't just need another blog or ebook. You start with purpose. Design with intent. Every interactive thing you build should be designed semantically for its purpose, not like that generic checkout process. Example, that's just a block of text. That's an interactive device where you choose the question to get the answer. Now, that's a simple version of designing with intent. Add meaning. The more we, well, actually, here's an example. What is that? OK, that's the third Thursday in March. That's meaningless to me. First day of spring, that means something to me. When we label our content uh, in the code level, often it gives it more meaning. So here, they're just blocks of text. You'd have to read them to know what they are. But if I know that's the value prop features and testimonials, it has more meaning. Show the product. I've written over 300 blog posts on landing pages, and probably less than five showed the product. That's not good enough. I, it's probably partly because I'm Canadian and don't really want to be that aggressive or salesy, but it's, we, we can't live like that and make it personal. Use the information we gather from interactive content to then make the experience more personalized in the moment. I'm going to show you how to do that. So it's not about my mother. It stands for Marketing Optimization Map. And this is a content marketing way of thinking, uh, content strategy, but focused entirely on product awareness. Its base is events. It's not so much about what page they go to. It's all the little interactions they did that led to conversion. And it's designed to really focus on aha moments to drive people there more quickly. It looks like a funnel, or maybe it's an exclamation point. It's actually a tie. This is how it works. So the context layer. What do we know about people when they arrive? Typically, maybe search terms or a little bit of demographics. I should use something like Clearbit where you'll know a bunch more. Uh, and what do we want to know? What do we need to know in order to create a better experience? What content, interactive content, do we need to create to gather that context to learn about people in the moment? Oh, also, that's the, that's the problem. When you look at analytics to see who's showing up, they're not there anymore, right? We need to do this in the moment. How can we show the product, and how can we personalize the experience based on the context we're gathering? And then there's this behavioral event map so we can see the difference in behavior between someone who does and doesn't convert. The aha moment happens. Aha! Who knows who this guy is? Yes, I just needed one. Validation. <laughs> so you've heard of aha moments before, but usually this is where people focus. I'm not going to talk about that. Lots of other people do, onboarding and product adoption. I want to talk about awareness, because that's that prior step that we're missing the point. We're not doing a good enough job with our content marketing in the awareness phase. Talk to your sales team, CS or customers, to figure out what they are. But the fastest and easiest way is talk to your sales team if you have one. Because they're the ones that have the face-to-face, mouth-to-mouth, that's creepy, uh, conversations with your customers. So they get to see, feel, and hear the reaction when people get it. Simple questions you can ask them. What feature made them get it? How did they react? How do they describe that feeling? What did they ask afterwards? That's very important for context. And how commonly does this thing occur? Because if it's just one person, it's not a real you know, aha moment. You need to see a bit of a pattern. 
and then you get them to the product. Okay, so that's the flow. That's what I'm going to go through. Four examples. Three will be kind of higher level to explain that concept, and one will be a kind of nerdy deep dive into more technical advanced content marketing. So the first one. Uh, put your hand up if you have a blog. Your company has a blog. All right, keep it up. Uh, now keep it up if you have if it's a software company. About half. This applies to anyone who has a blog attached to your website, not necessarily just a blog by itself, but anyone who has a business with a blog. What is the aha moment we're designing for? In this case, I just want people to know we have more than one product. Okay, that's my that's my goal with this content. What I was doing. So, what's the context? What do we know? Well, I know that. This is the header on every blog post on our website. It's the exact same as every SaaS company in the world. You cannot tell from that what we do. It doesn't even mention landing pages. It says nothing about our, con our, our product. So why would anyone click on any of that? No mention. Look at some heat maps. Nobody clicks the CTA in the header, and nobody clicks the CTAs in the sidebar. Because the content was so successful in January, I wanted to kind of figure out, was it just the content, or was it the, the way we changed the blog design? Because for just that month, we changed the design. Of, we took away the sidebar, and we changed the header. Right, so this is the content. How can we use content to redesign this experience? In this case, that's what it looks like. That's who we are. That's a value prop that was missing before. And those are the three products. That's instant product awareness. Because you can just see, oh, there's three products, and that's what they are. If, even if you don't interact with them, you have seen that. So you're just made more aware in a really simple way. So how do people interact with it, and what was the impact on signups? The context here is incredibly important. So this was only on the 20 posts in January. And because it performed well, four weeks ago, we turned it on for the entire blog, every blog post now has this design. If it's a post about landing pages, that's what happens. If it's about pop-ups, that's what happens. Sticky bars, that's what happens. Now, you might think that's a natural thing. It's just great to see it validated that it's actually the case. When you create content that's relevant to your products, people will engage with your products. It's really important that it's relevant. Now, this is the highest traffic post on our blog, and it's about email. Nobody signs up from this, because it's not about our product in any way, shape, or form. It's about, it's, because when we started out, we think, oh, let's just write a full stack blog. Let's just talk about everything about marketing. We attract all these different people. We see that all of these things that are not core to our product, nobody converts. All right, so product signups from this. Four weeks it's been running. Different blog categories. Landing page examples, we got a lot of traffic there. That's up 30%. Landing page category, same. CRO, up 36. PBC, down a little bit, but I'll take it. That's a massive improvement by having this product awareness focused experience. Okay, so that's a simple run through the three kind of levels. Now, this one's the more complicated one uh, choose your own adventure. This, our content is everywhere. It's messy. We have tons of it. It's not really connected. And it's missing purpose a lot of the time. So choose your own adventure. This is about helping guide people through your content, but giving them some options, but with kind of barriers that keep them moving towards those aha moments, not just going through any old content. Don't push them to the email thing get them going in the right direction, because we want them to experience those moments. I, I started this thinking like this in January. This is, a, one of our, this is our highest traffic page, not blog post. It's, what is a landing page? These are beginners, because they're typing in, what is a landing page? But I put these three nav options. I'm like, uh, what's your landing page needs? Well, I'm new. I'm like, oh, go check out landing page sessions. It's a video series, easy to watch, short, and it shows the product. I have a landing page, not how, sure how good it is, use the analyzer. I need to build one, push them in to the interactive demo to try and get them to the product. 
They're beginners. This is great information because I know I've shown that, yeah, I'm kind of wasting my time with the more aggressive ones so I can then change the experience. But again, that's manual labor. I want to find a way to use this type of device in a more uh, scalable manner. So I took a landing page course, and I, I'm working on redoing it. Now, this is six years old. I don't really agree with everything I wrote on it anymore. There's videos with our product from six years ago that look terrible, and nobody converts. It doesn't convert at all, but it gets a lot of traffic. So I needed to do something about that. So this is my kind of experimentation ground. All right, it looked ugly too. I wrapped it in a new design we had, but I left the content the same apart from the interactive content that I was adding to it. So context, what do we know? Well, they're not only marketers. I did some surveys on the, ex on the old site. Who's showing up? It's not just marketers. This is designers, developers, uh, business owners, CEOs, managers. I can't just design for marketers because other people have that same question. And the self-identified skill level and experience with landing pages is low. So they're beginners, and there's lots of different type of people. So the aha moments I'm designing for, we have about five that I work with. I'm going to go with two of them. Landing pages are better than home pages for paid. Beginners need to know that. Cut and paste between pages is really cool for designers because it speeds up their work. When they see it, they're like, oh, that's cool. Right? So they're the things I'm going to design for to try and encourage more signups. This is a spreadsheet of the aha moments and all the questions I want answered, the things I want to learn about people in the moment so I can change the experience. For example, what is your skill level? Now, I know a little bit about that, but I need to know in the moment so I can direct people appropriately. And what is your industry? I want to know that because we have industry-specific data. So I can give people access to that in exchange for them answering my question. If you get a little poll pop up in the corner like Kualaru, Hotjar, that's one way. You're giving information to someone, you get nothing in return. I want to build devices where it's mutually beneficial, you give something of value, and you get something that will help you personalize. So what kind of content do we need to create in order to do that? OK, well, our wise mother says, remember to design with intent. So I have I built this library of interactive objects. Now, a lot of them are familiar interactions, but I've changed the purpose for them. So when I use them, they have a very specific use case. There's navigational ones like uh, Anchor Navigation, there's Global Nav, there's the one we saw before. On demand, so video playlists, just like Netflix. Everybody likes that kind of thing. FAQ you saw before. And this one, it's called Segment. So this looks exactly like the FAQ. Tabs are just on the top. The difference, though, is that I would use it for a question like, what's your job role? Because I want to know that. Designer, marketer. The difference is it will drop a cookie based on the first response because you're self-identifying, that's me, but I want you to access, be able to access the rest of the content, because that could be useful for you in talking with your team. But I want to know who you are first. Like the poll question, you do it, and it's done. This one, you can keep exploring, but you're identifying who you are at the start. Very different use case. And then we have response reward. That's like the poll question, where I give you something in return. For example, what tech tools do you use? That's what it looks like when I built it. Select them. In this case, just showing the data. Sometimes you give them a reward, download, or whatever. Sometimes the data is enough, like a Twitter poll. People like to engage in that type of thing to learn something. In this case, I just needed a single answer poll. So this is what it looks like. I put this on the home page. I'm on the home page of the course. If I scroll down, you'll see a poll object designed to gather some context. So the question I have is, what industry are you in? If I click travel, all right, so I've unlocked the conversion benchmark report, and there is the travel specific data as a teaser, and you can get the full report there. And now with the cookie that So I've dropped the cookie now. I know they're in the travel industry. They got something hugely beneficial to them, uh, competitive analysis and conversion data, and I learned something about them. It's a nice exchange. 
So on the content side, I have a video. I'm teaching beginner information. So I talk about a concept, and then I jump into the app to demonstrate how to use it, and then I talk some more. That's great, the product's in there, but we can make it better with that context. So we take that, here's the video. I cut it up, and I recorded the demo portion 10 times. It's only a minute long, that portion. It was dead easy. Each time had a different template in it. So now, when someone watches this, that's me scrubbing through, when they get into the app, it's their industry. So the feature I'm demoing is designed to target the aha moment. They go, oh, that's cool. But the accelerant, that's the specific template, subconsciously or consciously, they'll be like, oh, oh this is a cool feature. Oh, wow, OK, that's cool. They'll relate to it. So that's an accelerant. It will take you to that moment more quickly. And I got to use that in the moment because I gathered the context and I had content ready to have a personal experience. So what does it look like on the, the data side, the event information that I'm collecting? Adding meaning, labeling the data. So on the code level, if you look at any of these buttons on the code, it's all labeled with attributes. What is the aha moment? What kind of object? What's the question? And the answer. You can put anything you want in here in your code. Data, dash, then anything you want. That name after the dash, whatever it is, Google Tag Manager can now access that directly. GTM is amazing. If you've never used it, try and dig in. It's the best product Google's ever made. I love it. And you can start pulling all of this rich data and push it in, push it in a GA. So now in GA, I've got, oh, these people are taking that quiz, and this is the, these are the answers. And I'm seeing how many and who is actually showing up. This is great for analysis after the fact, but the way I built it is great in the moment. Just for nerdy sakes, this is the architecture. So there's your content. That's the object library. GTM kind of holds it all together. I'm actually pushing it to an Amazon database so I can have all of this event stuff and do advanced reporting. Because GA, I'm putting it there, but it's not very good for event reporting. And then I can do reports from that and from the database. So that's kind of the architecture. And I'm trying to build this thing in a way that it's kind of productized. This should be a free tool so other people can use it. That's kind of my goal. All right, so the event map, what does it look like? You're getting all these events. This is every interaction that happens. So it's kind of like this. That's the aha moment I'm designing for. Those are the objects I'm using to ask those questions, and those are the answers that are coming in. Example report. The gray bars are how many people are answering that, and the green layer is who actually converts. So I can go, oh, all this stuff's happening, but the people that convert do that. When you design with purpose, you get more meaningful data. But you also need more meaningful ways of looking at that data. You need metrics that are better. Look at this. OK, so visitors watch, on average, 67% of your video. OK, that's, that's all right, but it's not very meaningful. 54% of visitors see the product in action. That's meaningful. That's helpful to me. I can work on designing experiences to increase the amount of product views. That's product in view. That's the metric there. 2% of visitors sign up. That's a great metric as a baseline, but it's not very rich. Visitors who trigger three or more product and view events are x more likely to convert than people who don't. That's meaningful. That's product view to sign up. These types of metrics and way of thinking change how we create content, how we measure it, and how we look at what's happening. In a video, 304, that's where the product and view happens. That's where you can trigger that aha moment. So I hacked a, a GTM plugin by Luna Metrics for Wistia videos. I use Wistia for my videos. And basically, so on my playlists here, I've put it, I've logged every moment when the product makes an appearance. So these events are firing through GTM every time someone sees the product. And now in GA, I have all of this exact timestamps of the video, not a percentage. I can see which ones they're watching, where they saw the product, and how many people are doing that. Way more meaningful data, way more accessible. If you have other people in your team, they can look in GA and they get it, because it makes sense. They don't have to have an analyst package it together. All right, so all these interactions, what is the impact? 
So I looked at some raw data yesterday, and if we look at people who did and didn't convert, in this instance, that's the CTA at the top that takes people to our live builder preview. That's what I want people to get into. Those who didn't convert, so average number of events, almost three times as many interactions for people who converted. Choose your own venture interactions, four times as many for people who converted. I think this interactive content works in concert with these people who are ending up as people who convert and with that information, because it's more enjoyable, right? You're kind of gamifying it, and it's better than just reading. And it gives us lots of opportunities to provide value and provide better experiences. All right, that's that one done. Question, what is the most clicked link on your homepage? Our logo, home. Nope. If you have any kind of customers, it's the login button, the login link right there. So this is a login hijack. This is a way you can use that information to create more product awareness. What aha moment. I just want people to know I have a new feature. Right? So that's a customer. I want them to know they have a new feature. What's the context? 35% of our traffic comes to the, coming to the homepage, they're just there to log in, they don't do anything else. I asked other founders, same stuff. I asked Twitter, same stuff. Scary though, a lot of people don't know. So they have polluted data because they think people are coming to their website and doing nothing, right? And it's also a massive opportunity, that's a lot of traffic. So what kind of interaction can we use? This is like, a, it's an interstitial thing with two options. I say interstitial, but that's a pop-up. But we shouldn't be thinking in terms of a pop-up. This is good interruption. This is beneficial. Our customers want to succeed. They need to know that information. So, oh, I want to learn more about that, or I'll just continue to log in. That is just an interactive mechanism to add value and also give me new context about how many people see and interact with this new thing about a feature. And I didn't have to do anything on the website. Right, no thing in a promo slider to announce something new. It's where people are going. I look for data in lots of places. Uh, Kissmetrics is one of them. So I was pulling data for this presentation. I went to Kissmetrics, and because you go to the homepage to log in, that's what I did. Kissmetrics.com, all right, let's visit that. Wait, what now? That just redirected to neilpatel.com. Do you want more traffic? No, I want Kiss Metrics, motherfucker. <laughs> That's not what I was looking for. Would you like to allow Neil Patel to send you notifications? I'm going to choose not on your life. Okay. And, and that's why. That's bad behavior. The technology is not the problem. Marketers are the problem when they abuse it. What I did before was useful. That's not a nice interruption. Things get better, though. I have a speaker page. I get a lot of requests through it. But I got a big spike in traffic. I didn't know why. Uh, but I was looking at my page. I'm like, oh, Rand's on there. Oh, Rand will know why this happened. But I didn't want to bug him. So I just searched instead. Rand Fishkin, how to figure out who links to your website. This was the top response. So I click on that. It's an old post about link building. I read a little bit, but it didn't answer my question. And there was no product in views, nothing, to, nothing actually functional to solve my problem. This is what I call no touch CRO. How to optimize your website without touching your website. Now, in this instance, I'm going to pretend to be someone from Mars, not from Unbounce. So, what's the aha moment? Oh, when I find out someone really cool linked to me and it explains why I got a traffic spike, that's cool. I want to design for people who are doing that because people who search for things about inbound links often come to link building posts in that category on the Moz blog. OK, that's the context. More context. Here's the category. If we scroll down, there are 304 blog posts about link building. Only one of them, I didn't read all of them, uh, mentions the solution, which is the new Link Explorer that got put into beta on May 4th. 
There it is there. If I come here, that might have been useful, but I didn't. So how do we solve this? What kind of interaction could have made this Hi, better? Moz fans and link builders, link builders, link builders, and link builders, link builders, link builders, and if I got this, this is useful. It's talking to what I'm looking for, and it's going to send me to a solution. Now, how do we do this in a way that's nice? So here are some it's triggers and targeting. That's what it's all about. Moz domain and the blog. Now, unfortunately, Moz uh, blog posts don't have the category and the link, so I couldn't target link building, but I just, I just do link. It's going to get close. Uh, we're going to say, when someone exits, that's the best place to start to get a signal of do people care, are people going to convert? And then I would adjust and make it like halfway scroll or 20 seconds, so it's not as aggressive. But I start there because you get the most insight. Only once. Always only once, because you're trying to be respectful here. And show it to everyone in the world apart from Seattle, because I'm sure you're all sick to death of Moz. Not really kidding. There's a punctuation there. Not really. I'm kidding. Not, not really kidding. <laughs> and then if you want to get even nicer, maybe you drop a cookie in the app. So don't show this to someone who already uses the product. So if I got that, I'd click on it. I'd come into Link Explorer, put in my speaker page, come down here, uh, highest domain that's linking to me, feedburner.com slash apple pie custard. What is that? Apparently, it's these guys. That's what their blog was called, at least in 2007. So English. Aha! It's just like that guy. All right, try that, Moz. It's a great way of respectfully increasing product awareness in a massive way. 304 blog posts. That's a lot of traffic coming in that you can use to give people something they're actually going to benefit from. Easy park at the start. What should they have done? Well, be a bit nicer because it's a bad experience. Thanks for paying early because the price goes up if you don't. What one of avoid finds will tell us when you usually park and get app notifications. 8 a.m. That's great. They got some data that's going to help them create more meaningful experiences and then show the app. So if I don't have it, I'll get it. If I do, I'll go in and set up the notifications. That's the way they should have provided that experience, mutually beneficial with a focus on their product. If you take away anything, from this talk, it's a true fact. Thank you very much. That's that landing page again. There's a form on there. If you're interested in when I kind of make that thing a free little tool, stick your email address in. I'll never email you unless I have that thing ready. Okay, and the slides are not there. I'll upload the PDF now. Thank you.